Thank you for listening to this service from Calvary Chapel Hastings. It's our hope that this message will help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. A father told his young boy to go to bed, and he started up the stairs but realized that he was too short to reached the light switch and it was dark upstairs so he came back down and said daddy I can't go up can you go with me and his dad said go upstairs God's there you know maybe you've done that to your kid and so he started up he knew that was the last word from daddy and he started up the stairs and he said God if you're up there don't jump out at me because you'll scare me you know, kids can be scared of the dark. My kids are scared of the dark. My little one is. Katie doesn't like to go up the stairs alone. She always asks me to go up the stairs with her so that uh, she's not scared of the dark. I can relate to that. When I was a kid, probably about six or seven years old, my parents went to a luau, which is kind of like a Hawaiian-themed party at our local swim club. And it was up the hill behind our house through the woods, and there's a big clearing, and then there's a swim club. So I sneaked up there to kind of spy on them one night. And they're having this party, and I'm outside the fence, and the whole thing is floodlit. And then it started to get dark, and I realized I had to leave and go home. So I turn around, and I see the trees, and they're all lit up. But behind the trees, it was completely pitch black. So I went up to the edge of the trees, and all I could see in there was black. And I just went... And I started running down the trail all the way down to try to scare off all the animals and bad people out there. I was scared of the dark. The world that we live in is a dark place. It's spiritually dark. People live in darkness, and it's a scary place. It's a lonely place, and it's an uncertain place. And the only light that people get spiritually is the light of Jesus Christ. He is the way that people can come out of the dark, the only way. Now today we're going to look at verses 6 through 13. Let me read to you what it says in uh, verse 4 to begin with, because it kind of introduces us to the light. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. So there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man was John the Baptist, not talking about John the Apostle. Now, John the Baptist was Jesus' second cousin. See, his mother, Elizabeth, was cousin to Jesus' mother, Mary. So they would have been second cousins. And John was quite a character. Uh, If you read through the Gospels, you know that John was a guy who ate locusts and wild honey. He wore coats of camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt around his, his waist. And he was out in the wilderness, and he was a fiery preacher. I like the way some movies depict John the Baptist. We have a movie from the Gospel of John. And the John the Baptist that they depict in there is, he looks like he's been through electroshock therapy. He's like, brood of vipers, you know, repent, and that kind of thing. He just looks bizarre. But he was an intense character. And his message was one of repentance. He was telling the people of Israel that they needed to repent and turn to God. And so he was an intense character. He's quite a character. Now, Jesus said about John the Baptist that he was the greatest man born of women. What a compliment. The greatest man born of women. He was the last Old Testament prophet. Jesus said all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. So sometimes we think of Malachi as the last Old Testament prophet, but actually it was John the Baptist. He preached under the law, and then Jesus came to preach the grace of God. So he was the last Old Testament prophet, but he was also the greatest of the prophets. He was essentially Jesus' best man. See, he was 
the friend of the bridegroom, Jesus said. All the other prophets who prophesied before John said, The Messiah is coming. John the Baptist was the only one who could say, The Messiah is here right now. There he is. He was a man, it says here, sent from God. Now, back in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, in chapter 3, verse 1, this is written about 400 B.C., God said, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. So way back, 400 B.C., God said, I'm going to send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And then again in Malachi 4, 5, just a bit later, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, Jesus said that if you can receive it, John the Baptist is Elijah who is to come. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. So that was his ministry to turn people to God before Jesus came. Now, Elijah is going to come again. He's going to come in the flesh, the real prophet of Elijah, not just John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah. And some people think that he will be one of those in Revelation 11, one of the two witnesses there. But John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, notice God said twice there in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, I send a messenger and I will send Elijah. These two prophecies were fulfilled in John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a prophet who was prophesied about. He was the greatest man born of woman. Now, question for you. John the Baptist was sent... Does God still send people today? Does he have people that he sends? We've just heard about Elizabeth's work in Tanzania. She's been sent there by God to do that work. Yes, absolutely God sends people to do work today. In fact, he's sending you to do a work today. I'll read to you what Jesus said in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying... All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is what we refer to as the Great Commission. This is when Jesus commissions all believers to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. God, if you're a Christian, God has commissioned you. In the military, a commissioning service is when a soldier is given authority to carry out his or her assigned duty. He's got authority to do what he's called to do. And so your assigned duty as a Christian is to go into all the world and to make disciples of all the nations. That's your assigned duty. Your authority is given to you by God. Look what Jesus said. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And I take great comfort in that. Because you know just like I do, when you go out to share your faith or make disciples, that you run into all kinds of opposition. When you're sent, you run into people who oppose you. You're going to be opposed by demons. You're going to be opposed by enemies. You're going to be opposed by difficulties and trials and temptations and physical needs. Anything that can come against you as you step out and share your faith will come against you. But you know what? Jesus is more powerful than any of those things. He's got all authority in heaven and on earth. So no matter what comes against you, you know that the authority of God is behind you to overcome those things. And I like that. That gives me great confidence going out to share my faith. God kept his promise to bring John the Baptist to the earth. And God's going to keep his promises to you too. Think about some of the promises that God has given to you. It says in Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does it say in 1 Peter 5, 7? Casting all your care on him, 
for he cares for you. Philippians 4.19 My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Whatever you need, whatever comes against you, God has more authority than that and he will provide for you. His promises will come true to you too. And so God does send people today, just like he sent John the Baptist. Look at verse 7. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He says he came to bear witness of the light. Light speaks of God's glory. You remember Jesus when he was transfigured on the mount? It says that his clothes and his being just became so white, it was like the snow. It was brighter than any launderer could launder his clothes. He was basically turned inside out. He revealed his glory. And so the light speaks of God's glory. The light speaks of God's omniscience. Speaks of knowledge. God has all knowledge. You know, in cartoons, when a cartoon character gets an idea, what happens? A little light bulb pops up. Ding! Right? I got it. The pennies dropped. I've got the idea. God knows everything. He's omniscient. He's a big know-it-all. God can't learn anything because he already knows it. He can't learn what's going to happen to you tomorrow. It's not a surprise to him. He knows it already. Jesus himself knew people's thoughts. There's a story in in Mark chapter 2 when four guys were carrying their paralytic friend up on top of a building where Jesus was preaching. The room where he was preaching was so packed they couldn't get in, so they carried him on top, picked through the tile, and then lowered their friend down in the middle of this crowd. So Jesus turns and he looks at this man and he said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And right then, the scribes who were listening to that started to murmur in their own hearts. This is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And it says that Jesus perceived in his spirit that they argued about the things in their heart. And so he just turns to them and says, why do you argue about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, rise up and take your bed and walk, or that your sins are forgiven? He knew what was in their heart. He has omniscience. He knows everything. And so the light speaks of God's omniscience. The light also speaks of God's holiness. 1 Timothy 6.16 says, that God dwells in unapproachable light. God is so holy. He's so pure and so perfect that he dwells in unapproachable light. As as sinful people, we just can't walk into the light. We need to come through Jesus Christ. And so it speaks of his holiness. It also speaks of God's word, the light does. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so we see here the light of God speaks of his glory, his omniscience, his holiness, and his word. John the Baptist came to bear witness of that light. To bear witness. The word witness is a judicial term. It means to give a testimony in a court of law. It's to tell what a person heard or saw. So John came to give a witness. The Greek word translated for us in English witness is the Greek word marturia. It's where we get our word martyr. And a martyr is a person who lays down his life for his beliefs. Now what did John the Baptist lay down his life for? He laid down his life to bear witness of the light. In other words, he laid down his life to tell other people about Jesus Christ. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, that's good for John the Baptist, but I just can't do that. I mean, I'm too afraid. I can't open my mouth and speak about Jesus. Well, if you're afraid to talk about Jesus, if you're afraid to be a witness for him, you're not alone. You know, the very first disciples, the apostles, were afraid to share their faith too. When Jesus was arrested, every single one of them fled in fear of the Jews. They were afraid. And it wasn't until after Jesus rose from the grave 
that something happened inside of them that changed them from being afraid like that to being bold in their witness. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. When the Holy Spirit came upon them in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, something changed inside of those scared apostles, scared disciples, that changed them from being cowards to being courageous. And it was the power of the Holy Spirit within them. There is no way that any of us can be an effective witness for the light until we are endued with power from on high. We are going to be too afraid. And the pressures of the world are going to be too great for us. But you remember what the Bible says. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And so he can make that change inside of each one of us. If you're struggling with your witness, ask the Holy Spirit to come and empower you, to overflow you, and he will. There was a guy years ago that I was just really afraid to share my faith with. As some of you know, I used to be a, a tennis coach. And one of the guys I used to coach was um, kind of a high-powered businessman. He was a designer for Philips Semiconductors, very opinionated, very loud mouth. I used to listen to how he'd speak to his wife, and he'd put her down a lot. I was intimidated by this guy. Also very wealthy. On all his tennis clothes, he would write his own name. He'd stencil it in there. He was an intimidating character. And I wanted to witness to him. I'd been a Christian for a couple of years. And I, I prayed one day. I said, Lord, I'm scared of Eddie. I, I want to share my faith with him, but I just can't. And I just pray that you would give me the power to do it today. And so he came for his lesson, and um, we started talking. And I said, Eddie, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And he said, well, I live by the Ten Commandments. And I think that was kind of the way he would dismiss other Christians in the past. I live by the Ten Commandments. And I said, well, that's interesting. I don't live by the Ten Commandments. I die by the Ten Commandments. Have you ever read the Ten Commandments? And he said, no, I haven't. I said, would you want to read them with me? Okay. So we read the Ten Commandments. Eddie, have you ever lied before? Yeah. Have you ever stolen anything? Yeah. Have you ever committed adultery? Yeah. Have you ever cursed or sworn? Yeah. Well, I've heard you do it a bunch of times. We went through about five or six of them, and he said, You're right. I, ha I don't live by the Ten Commandments. I said, Do you want to come to church with me on Sunday? He said, Yes. I said, What? <laughs> I didn't say what, but I just said, Wow, you know, in my heart. He came with his wife to church that Sunday. And both of them got saved. And to this day, they walk with the Lord. I couldn't believe it. There was a man that I was too intimidated to actually open my mouth and witness to, but the Holy Spirit gave me boldness to share Christ with this man. And God can do that with you too. You need the power of the Spirit to be a witness. Let's look in the next verse. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. John knew that he wasn't the light. Look down in, in verse 19. It says, Now this was the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. I'm not Christ. Now sometimes we get in our heads, I have to be perfect in order to be a witness. I'm not as good as I should be, so I can't serve the Lord. Or, I've only been a Christian for a short time, so I can't tell other people about Jesus. Or, what if somebody asks me a question that I don't understand? I really can't be a, a, a witness for Jesus, can I? You know what, if somebody ever asks you a question that you can't understand, first say this to them. That's a good question. I'll find the answer for you and I'll get back to you. But then say this. Though I don't know the answer to that question, I do know this. And then tell them what you do know. You see, if you're just a baby Christian, if you're a Christian for one day, 
You know enough to save somebody else. You might have the testimony of, you know what, I was just blind, but now I see. Or, I went to this church and I got saved, and now my sins are forgiven. That's all I know. And that's enough of a witness to save someone else. You remember the woman at the well? Jesus went and spoke to the woman at the well. And after he spoke to her for a time, she left Jesus and went to town. And her testimony after she had met Jesus was just this. Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? That's all she knew. And she went and witnessed for Jesus. And the townspeople came out and got saved. Incredible, isn't it? The moment that she became a believer, she went and witnessed. Bill Bright, who was the leader of Campus Crusade for Christ, said this, Although I have shared Christ personally with many thousands of people throughout the years, I am a rather reserved person, and I do not always find it easy to witness. But I have made this my practice, and I urge you to do the same. Assume that whenever you are alone with another person for more than a few moments, you are there by divine appointment to explain to that person the love and forgiveness he can know through faith in Christ. So Bill Bright's idea about witnessing was that the green light was on all the time, that he had the opportunity, he was given the commission, and that he had the green light to share his faith any time. And I think that's a really good way to go through life as a witness for Jesus. Look in verse 9. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Another way to render this is, that is the true light which coming into the world gives light to every man. So in other words, the phrase coming into the world speaks of the light not man. Okay, it's speaking of Jesus coming into the world, not man coming into the world. Now, God has revealed himself to man in two ways. First, there's the light and general revelation. The general revelation of God is through creation and through conscience. It tells us in Romans 1 and Romans 2 that every single person on the planet knows that God exists by creation and by conscience. So when you look at the things that are made, you know that a creator had to create that. If you look at design, you know that a designer had to design it. And the conscience. Every person on the planet has a conscience they're born with, knowing right from wrong. So we have that general revelation of God, that light of the conscience and creation. But secondly, there's this. There's the light of special revelation. Special revelation is the Word of God and Jesus Christ. He is the greatest revelation. I'm going to read to you what it says in in Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world's. So the writer of Hebrews is saying that God spoke in the past through the prophets, but in the last days he's spoken by the greatest revelation of all, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus could say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He has my character. He has my nature. And so he's the greatest revelation. Now, the phrase gives light to every man doesn't mean that every man has received an inner knowledge of Jesus Christ, or that every man has heard the gospel. There are multitudes of millions of people today who have never heard the name of Jesus. So that's why Jesus gave us the Great Commission to go into all the world and tell those people. But this phrase, gives light to every man, means that the light of Jesus, first of all, reveals every man's character. You know, if I compare myself to Adolf Hitler, I can look pretty good. But when I compare myself to Jesus Christ, the perfect light, I see my sin. And it causes me to to realize I need a Savior. And so his light reveals my true character. But also, the light of Jesus shines on every man. 
regardless of race, nationality, sex, or color. The light of Jesus shines indiscriminately on every man. You know, in Revelation 5, it talks about around the throne of God, there are going to be people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Some people say, hey, isn't Christianity a Western religion? A Western religion? It's a world religion. It came out of the Middle East, but it's for everybody, every tribe, every nation. God doesn't discriminate. The light of Jesus shines on every person. Now, there was a man who was once complaining to a, a missionary about missions to Africa. He said, how can you go to Africa and preach to them about love when there is so much injustice in your own country? And the missionary said to him, we don't go in and preach about God's love. We just go in and love them. God's love, God's light shines on all people, on everyone. Look back in John chapter 1 and then verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He was in the world, though the world was made through him, the world didn't know him. Sometimes when I go outside, I look up at the sky, and I just imagine there's coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to come back, and he's going to ride on the clouds, and he's going to come back to establish his earthly kingdom. And I think, I wonder what that's going to be like. How's it going to look when Jesus is riding on the clouds of heaven, coming back to the earth to rule and to reign for a thousand years? It's going to be amazing. When he came the first time, though he was the world's creator, the world didn't know him. They didn't perceive him. It's a Greek word there, gnosko. They thought he was just another man like themselves, and they crucified him. Peter told the Jews in Acts chapter 3, You killed the author or the originator of life, whom God raised from the dead. How could this happen? When Jesus came the first time, how could it happen that when he came, people didn't recognize their very own creator? What shows how much sin is dark in the heart of man that mankind wouldn't even recognize their creator when he came. I was reading this week about pit ponies. Years ago, they used pit ponies to do a lot of work in the mines in Wales and, and in Yorkshire and, and other places. And pit ponies would go down into the mines at age four, and sometimes they'd stay underground for 10 to 15 years, only coming up for about a week or maybe two weeks in the summer. 10 to 15 years living underground. And sometimes when they came up, they were blinded for a time. Often people say that they, they were permanently blind. There's some discussion about that. But the fact is that when they came up, they couldn't really see very well because they hadn't been exposed to the light. And they had a hard time adjusting. You know, people can live in darkness so long that they think it's normal. You can live in the darkness of this world so long that you just get used to it. And that's really what shocked me when I was around born-again Christians for the first time in my life. I saw them and I realized that they were living a different life than I was living. They were living in the light. There was a different way to live and I thought, they have something that I don't have and I want it. It was very attractive to me, this life in the light. And so, you know, he came and the people that he came to save, they didn't even recognize who he was. Look in verse 11. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Now, when it says he came to his own, the first own there is in the neuter gender. It means his own domain. Literally, it means Israel. He came to Israel, his nation. He was their Messiah, their king. But his own did not receive him. And that second own is in the masculine gender, and it means his people, the Jews. So by and large, when Jesus came, the Jewish nation rejected him as their Messiah. Of course, the first Christians were Jews, but by and large, the Jewish nation rejected Jesus. They said, basically, we will not have this man to rule over us. And their rejection of Jesus continues to this very day. 
Even though today there are more Messianic Jews than ever before. In fact, if you go to Israel, there are 100 Messianic churches in Israel. There are more Messianic Jews today than ever before, but by and large, the nation has rejected him and will continue to reject him until the end of a period we know as the Great Tribulation. Zechariah 12 tells us at the end of that period, the Jews are going to cry out to God to save them, and Jesus is going to come back and save them, and he's going to establish his kingdom on the earth. Verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. So, in his day, some rejected him, but some received him. And it's the same thing today. You know, when the, the gospel goes out, when you hear it or you read it, some people will hear that and be convicted by the Spirit, and they will follow that conviction to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I want to be saved, and they'll believe and be saved. Other people will say, I don't have anything to do with that. Don't tell me about that, Jesus. I don't want to hear it. Leave me alone. Let me stay in the dark. Some people say, you know what? I'm not against Jesus or anything. I'm just not for him. Well, Jesus said, if you're not for him, you are against him. It's the same thing today. Some people receive him, some people reject him. Now, notice at the end of that verse, to those who believe in his name. To believe in his name is believing in who he is and what he did. Who was he? Well, he was God in human flesh, and he died on the cross, was buried, and the third day he rose from the grave. Now, his name is Jesus. That's, his, that's the English name. The Greek name is Jesus. The Hebrew name is Yeshua or Joshua. And his name means Jehovah is salvation. Now, there were a lot of Jesuses around the time of Jesus. It was a very common name, just like John is a common name today. So it wasn't enough just to believe in any Jesus, but it's to believe in the Jesus who was the Christ, the Son of God, God in human flesh. That's the one who can save you. And to believe is not just to intellectually believe. The Bible says even the demons believe and tremble. But it's to believe in your heart, to receive Christ into your own life. You know, some people miss eternal life by 13 inches. It's the distance between the head and the heart. They intellectually agree that Jesus was a real person, but they haven't received Christ as their Lord and Savior into their heart. And so real faith, real belief, also receives. Real faith receives. He says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right, the power, the authority, the privilege to become the children of God. Aren't we all children of God? Aren't all people in the world children of God? You know, what about the universal fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man? Well, you know what? It's not true. We're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. You have to be, you have to be born again in order to become a child of God. Jesus said to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, you are of your father, the devil. These were Pharisees. They were religious people, but they were not children of God. They were not born again. We have to become children of God by receiving Christ and being born again spiritually. Look in verse 13, last verse we'll look at. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. People who are born again are not born of blood. It's not by a physical human descent. So no one is saved because their parents are saved. No one is a Christian because their parents were Christians. It's been said that God has no grandchildren. He only has children. So every person has to make a decision for Christ. Nor of the will of the flesh. So it's not by human effort that a person is born again. I'm trying really hard. You know, if I can just be really good, then... I'll be saved. You can't save yourself. It's not 
be good, it's receive Christ. Nor of the will of man, he says. You know, you can't make someone else be a Christian. As much as you want it for them, you can't do it. You know, maybe a husband will say, Honey, let's, uh, let's have some Christian children. When, of course, as parents, you're going to teach your kids about Christ. You're going to train them in the ways of God. But you can't will your kids to be Christians. They have to make their own choice. They've got to receive Christ for themselves. So it's not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but it's of God. Jesus said, we must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. We must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. It's not by human effort. It's a work, a sovereign work of God in our hearts. Our job is to believe and to receive. As we close, you know, it, it's been said that if we're born once, we'll die twice. If we're born twice, we'll die once. If we're born of our mother physically, but then we're born again of God spiritually, we're only going to die once. We're just going to die physically, but spiritually we're going to live on forever and ever. But if we're only born of our mother and we're not born again spiritually, then we're going to die twice because not only are we going to die physically, we're also going to die spiritually. We're going to be separated forever from God in hell. And that's not God's plan for anyone. God wants all men to be saved, to be born again. And so, question for you. Are you born again? Are you a child of God? Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I'm not asking if, you, if your parents are saved or if your friends are saved, or if you believe in your mind that Jesus is God, I'm asking, have you received him as your Lord and Savior? Are you born again? You need to be. If you look at the law that my friend Eddie looked at, and you just ask yourself the same question he asked, have I lied before? Have I disobeyed my parents? Have I stolen anything? Have I lusted? Have I cursed? And the answer to any one of those is yes. You've broken God's law, and you're just like the rest of us. You're a sinner, and you need to be saved. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So what Jesus did was he died on the cross to pay the death sentence for you so that you could be forgiven and that you could be born again. And what happens when you do that is this. The Holy Spirit comes in, and he gives you an assurance that you are a child of God. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It's a wonderful verse. It means that the Holy Spirit comes in and causes us to cry out to God, Abba, Father. It's a really intimate term. No longer is God a distant deity, but he is our intimate Abba, Father, our Daddy. And we can have a relationship with him like that, so close and so intimate. And his spirit bears witness or or tells our spirit that we are indeed born again children of God. So, if you're here this morning and you're not sure... You can be sure today. You can ask Jesus to come into your life and the Holy Spirit will come in and be a witness to your own spirit that you are saved. Not going to hell, but going to heaven. Father, we just give you thanks this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us your spirit to bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Lord, we thank you that You've given us a purpose. You've given us a commission to be a witness of the light in this world. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us power by your Spirit to overcome our fears, to overcome intimidation and all the things that come against us, and to give us your authority to do the thing you've called us to do. We just praise you for that, Lord, this morning. And 
We pray for anyone here among us who has not yet made Jesus Lord and Savior of their lives, that today would be the day of salvation for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to this service from Calvary Chapel Hastings. If you would like more information about what you've heard in this message or about Calvary Chapel Hastings, please visit our website at www.calvarychapelhastings.co.uk If you have made the decision to follow Christ and would like someone to pray with you, contact us on 01424 422 770 01424 422 770 Thank you and God bless. He didn't die in vain. He was thinking of you when he hung in your place. Skeet